Okay, so uh, hello from my side as well. My name is Sebastian Daschner. I'm from Germany, from Munich, a freelancer working in Java EE. And today I want to talk about uh, putting hypermedia back in REST with JAXRS and Java technology. So who of you has been using um, REST in real world projects? Hands up. Uh, a few. Yeah, very good. Okay, I want to show you um, some examples how some REST APIs, or at least what is considered to be REST, in real world could look like. So if you look at real world REST APIs, you may have seen something like this. This is a description of an HTTP call, what it could look like with an HTTP method and a URL and some request and response bodies. So now what we're doing here, we are posting to some URL, some request body and get some response back here. So the URL um, is named do some action or make something, perform something, so named like a verb. So if you look at it, it somehow feels like a remote procedure call over HTTP, right? So not really like performing something on objects rather than calling a method over HTTP. And this is probably not what REST is considered to be. And I've seen a lot of examples like this and it doesn't even matter if you're calling a method or you're retrieving some information with like get some information here. What obviously should be a HTTP get method, right? Rather than a post. And again, some request and response bodies. So REST um, is also about resources. So the resources in your REST API should in fact reflect your business object of your application. What does that mean? If you have some user management software, for example, then you're talking about users in your software, right? You're always talking about some objects, so your classes, like object-oriented programming. And these objects should be also reflected using your API using your URLs which you have, like this example. You have a list of users here, represented by the users resource. And you can read these, uh, this list by calling get on the users here. And as a response, you will get the list of all users back. Here it's XML, it could also be JSON, it doesn't matter. And you get the list of users with each specific user, like this Duke, with an ID and so on and so forth. And this is how you access them, rather than calling post on get all users, right? So you see the difference on, on using these resources here. And this is the resource for all users, for the list of users. You might also have a resource for one specific user. Probably it could be called like users slash 12345, right? With the ID down there. And um, this is what I want to talk about later a little bit more. For now, you probably assume if you want to have one user, you take the resource users, you put a slash and then the ID of the response to follow the specific user, right? So you need to know how the URLs are created to follow that specific user, which is again an object, one resource. And now you could see that semantic HTTP was used, or rather HTTP was used in the, m in the way how it's meant to be following the RFC how HTTP is specified. Like you read something, you read a resource on the server and therefore you call get rather than you're posting and calling a somewhat method of the wire. And this is another example how some action can be performed actually. So now again we have that user management um, example and now you want to create a new user. So you're posting some information to the user's response uh, the resource, right? So you have the user with the duke and the model again and now you're posting this information to the user's resource and as a response you get a status code back. And now as you can see not everything is always 200 OK from HTTP, right? There are al also a lot more status codes and for example this one 201 created which means that the new resource has been created on the server which is the case as you created just a new resource there your new user and the location here is telling you where to find that new user and that location is exactly the point where hypermedia kicks in because in hypermedia 
you are linking resources which are somewhat related to your current resource together in the meta information so that your client can follow the resources in a self-explanatory fashion like you would do on a website by following links rather than assuming how the URLs could be created or how uh, the URLs could look like. So if you have the user's example again, if you implement hypermedia, then it would look somewhat like this. We have the user's uh, resource again, but now you're explicitly linking to the specific users using a link with a self-relation. And the self-relation, that string, tells the client that the link here um, corresponds to the user's object right there. So we may have 20 different users and each of the user has a link to I its own resource, right? With the user slash and then the ID. And now the difference is that the client no longer has to assume how the URLs are created with user slash and then take the ID, rather than it just follows blindly this link which has been provided here, knowing the self-relation, right? Any questions so far? By the way, I forgot to mention, if you have questions anytime, please just raise your hand and interrupt me. You will get rewarded with stickers. <laughs> so that's good. Just uh, interrupt me if you have any questions. All right. So here's another example where hypermedia can help you. So you just saw that hypermedia can indeed help you to um, get, the con get the server the control back of the URLs, right? So the client does not have to know um, how the URLs are created, rather than just the server knows that, and the server can even change this. And here is another helpful example. So this is about books, like you would have in an Amazon bookstore API. So we have a book here, it's JSON, but it doesn't matter, um, with a name, probably an author, ISBN, availability, and links again like the self-relation to the same book. And now we also have an add to cart link where the functionality could reside when you actually want to add that book to your shopping cart and your Amazon account. So now you imagine for example, um, if you have a client using that API and you want to display a nice shopping cart icon when you want to add that book to the shopping cart in your client, right? But maybe you only want to add that icon if, let's say, the book is available or your user has some certain credit on his account or whatever your business logic may look like. And now, rather than telling on the client side, if availability equals in stock or something else, then display the, um, that button, you don't want to do this because this would be redundant logic on both the server and the client, right? And it should, in fact, be server logic. So you now taking that link add to cart with that relation and now if and only if that link uh, is shown in the response here you are actually showing that button on your client so now you don't have the business logic on your client anymore because the client only relies on that links which are provided by the server right and you can get rid of the redundant business logic in your client now which is a good thing and now you you can eliminate these things again. Make sense? Okay, now you may have one question. Um, for example, this is simple for links which uh, will be called with get, right? But what if we now want to do some actions like we did before with the create user? What if we want to add that book to the shopping cart because we probably need to post something to that URL, right? And post some information like JSON or XML actually and therefore we have a more complex example um, this is in fact a siren um, a content type called siren I will explain that in a minute and now imagine the same resource again with the books and the name and author and so on and the links and now we also have something called actions and as you can see we now have the add to cart action again but we now can provide all the information the client needs to know what we need on the server side that the book can be added to the shopping cart like HTTP method, URL, which content type do I want to have and which information actually do I need here and as you can see we need to post something to the shopping cart URL 
should be application JSON and I need the field ID and quantity, right? And now the client only needs to know the add to cart relation, so what that functionality actually is, what is add to shopping cart, and of course where the fields, namely ID and quantity, come from. Like the ID could be um, included in your resource, in your response before, and the quantity, how many books do I want to add to the shopping cart, could be like a drop down box or something. But this is uh, clearly client logic. So it's totally fine that this relies on the client side. And now you eliminate even more logic how your API could be used because that no longer has to implicitly reside on the client side before, rather than the client can really adapt to changes even on the server side, it won't break anymore. And now the client can really autonomically navigate through your API, right? And even use more complex functionality rather than just simple links. Questions so far? Everything clear? Very good. So um, this content type is called Siren. There are several hypermedia enabled content types. Um, all of them here are JSON, but actually it doesn't matter if it's JSON or XML. This is all valid JSON uh, content type, but in a certain structure. So as you would expect, like HTML it is. Like HTML also has links and so on and so forth. And these content type have so has some certain extensions like links or for Siren even actions where you can provide some more information how your API is used. So you can have a look at uh, all of them. These are all kind of approaches to standardize hypermedia formats. There has none of them has really one so far, so there's no one big standard uh, which content type to use. This is actually a question you would have to ask yourself when building in a hypermedia, uh, um, hypermedia API because these content types give you a certain level of control of, uh, of control what you want to include in your response because some of them don't know actions, some of them are simpler then easier to use but uh, don't, um, don't give you that much power. Alright, so enough of the slides, let's implement something, right? And as this talk is called Putting Hypermedia Back with JuxRS, we of course use Java E technology and JuxRS to build a hypermedia driven API. So I will use Maven to um, build and create a project. Who of, we, uh, who of you has been using Maven in production? Hands up. Maven, a build tool. I hope there are more. It's pretty common, I would say. Okay, at least a few. Um, so here I'm using um, a Maven archetype just to simply create a fresh new Maven Java E7 project, which I will then um, code from scratch. And I will use IntelliJ to open that. So I will just go to the newly created project. And as you can see, it doesn't contain anything yet. The ones of you who have been using Maven in production probably know th uh, files like this. This is the Maven um, project object model, the POM file. And I will show you here that I'm not uh, only using the Java E dependency. So this enterprise application has no third-party dependencies, only Java E7, plain project. And this is even provided. So what does that mean? It will not end up in your WAR file, which is good because your deployment artifact, your WAR file, is almost empty, which I will uh, explain a little bit more in a second. And the project itself is almost empty. It contains only um, a JuxRS configuration class, but this is pretty boring, um, just to bootstrap the JuxRS application. And now I will code some JuxRS resources here. The examples were about books, so we will um, program something about books. This will be called books resource. It will be a root JuxRS resource, so we put the add path annotation with books on it. So it will end up as the URL slash books, right? 
And of course, we want to have some methods here as well. So we will include a um, resource of all books and then a resource of one specific book or for each specific book, actually. So now we have the add get annotation and this will provide us a list of books, right? With get books. And of course, we need to um, add the book as well. This will be just a simple POJO containing all the data we have, like an ID, right? A name, an author, and maybe a price. Oh, by the way, please don't do money calculations with floating point numbers, right? This is just an example. Okay, and of course, getters and setters. And just for convenience, some constructors with some right field orders. Yeah. So this is it. Pretty simple. This is just a POJO for our books, right? Which will be returned in our JAXRS resource list of books here. And as this is an uh, enterprise project, we will probably have our books returned from some EJB, right? which will be injected here. Um, let's call it bookstore. And this EJB will create um, the books for us. In an enterprise project, this probably would load some data from the database or somewhere else, but here it actually doesn't matter because we want to focus on the JAXRS side. So we just um, create some dummy objects which we can use to work on get books and this will return a new list of just some dummy objects. We will create a book with an ID 1 named Java written by Duke with a price and another book named Hello Osaka and that's it. And we will have another method, which we might need later, which returns one book. That will be used for the um, resource, which um, only returns a single book, which probably would be loaded from the database here. But it doesn't matter, because now we want to, to focus only on the JAXRS side. Which means here we take the EJB load the books and return them, right? For the list of all books. And we have a second JAXRS method for the single books which use the ID in a path, right? You remember book slash one, two, three, four, five and return one book, get book from an ID so we use the so-called path param annotation to inject this ID to the method. So we can use the ID which was actually used as the path parameter here, which will be provided for the EJB. And the same story again, we have the book and we'll return it. But this is actually pretty boring because it only contains data yet and nothing hypermedia specific like real links right so of course we want to have some links now and in the first example which I want to show you I will include the links in the POJO directly so something like I showed in the slides like here with um, links and then some links identified by relations right so we will use some map from string to URI is called links will be a hash map so the string will be the relation and we want to have the underscore link as a name and even though we uh, will return JSON data you can in fact use JAXB annotations to modify how your JSON output will look like because all of the um, JSON implementations will take JAXB annotations into account. So we can actually write XML ele element 
and provide a different property name here. And the good thing uh, about that, thanks, is that we don't need any other third-party de uh, dependencies. Because if you would use something like Jackson here, then you already got another third-party dependency in your WAR file, and you probably don't want that. So we can go with still with plain Java E7 here. So we can use this to modify the output, and maybe the ID should not be included in your JSON output, so we use the transient annotation. And we will tell JAXB that the fields are used here to annotate. And of course, we need a getter and setter for the link map, right? And that's it. So we modified our POJO to include the links as well. And even though it will be JSON, which we will tell the JAXRS class by the addProducers annotation with a fancy media type, in this case, JSON. So it will produce application JSON here. And that's it. And now we, of course, need the links with the relations here in the books, right? Because uh, until now, they only contain the data like name and author, right? And as we're using Java E7 with Java 8, we will, of course, use fancy lambdas and streams from the Java 8 API to modify and create the links here in our JAXRS resource. So we have the book get links, which ge gives us the links map, and we will include a self URI in this map. And this URI will be created. And Okay, now we need a URI to books slash run to three four five or slash ID from that book, right? And of course, we don't want to um, repeat ourselves all over again how the URIs should be look like, right? So fortunately, JAXRS gives uh, gives us some helpful functionality how this can be accomplished without redundant logic. So there is a nice context managed object here which can be injected with at context and it's the name is URI info and this is shipped with JAXRS and the JAXRS implementation will create that object which helps us now to create URIs only from the information which is already there and what does that mean? We have an URI builder with a builder pattern like way to create URIs with some paths on it and we can refer to a JAXRS class here. And this will give us a URI which contains this string here. Because this will access, access this class and read the add path annotation and the value here, books, and create the URI with the books out of it. And of course, we also need the ID part. So we can also access a method from that class with a string get book and this will give us this annotation here or actually the value from it and now we have the book plus that path parameter but of course we do not want to have curly brackets ID right rather than we want to have the real ID and this is why you can also specify while building that URI some arguments which will be used to substitute these parameters down here and this will in fact create a URI containing this books path plus slash ID with the actual ID taken from the book which will give us the real, I, uh, the real URI of that book here and include the whole thing in the book POJO and that's it and then we have the links for all the books which will be added in the lambda for each here. And the same thing will be done down there. And of course we will copy paste program the whole thing and do the same thing here to create that URI again for the single book which was loaded from the EJB and then include that URI in the links map. Questions so far? No questions?
All right, then we will try to run the whole thing, right? So as we're using Maven in our project, we, we will use Maven clean install to build the whole thing into a WAR file. And as we're using plain Java E7 only, without any dependencies, even faster than I could talk, this is already finished, because the WAR file is basically empty. I can show you this, if you don't believe me. The WAR file here contains only the classes which I wrote, like the books resource, and that's it. And as you can see, no jar files or anything else. The WAR file itself is about 6K, which is nothing compared to normally megabytes of external dependencies, right? And now we will deploy the whole thing on Wildfly or any other um, Java E7 compliant application server. And as the WAR file is very small, it's already finished, it is also very fast to deploy the whole thing. And now we can use any REST client of your choice to access that API, right? So whatever you want to use. I probably, I normally use Postman. It's a Chrome extension, but actually it doesn't matter. But the font size is probably too, large uh, too small for that projector. So I will use command line features like curl. As I said, it actually really doesn't matter what you use to access this uh, HTTP API. And this hopefully runs on localhost 8080. Um, the context name was Juxres Hypermedia. Resources was the name of the Juxres application, the bootstrap thing, and of course, books. And as you can see, this is the JSON data from a JSON array. And as I'm a um, Linux hacker, I of course want to pipe this to pretty print the JSON output. And here you can see th the JSON array with the objects. And the interesting thing, the created URI, which points to resources book slash one, the ID of these two books here. And of course, we can also query a single book, which will give us the single JSON object. Questions so far? So that was an approach how to build um, to build links and to include links with POJOs. But what if you do want to do something more complex, like this um, more complex hypermedia-enabled me uh, content type, with uh, like Siren with actions here and so on and so forth? You of course can do this with POJOs as well, but then you have another a lot of nested objects, right? With actions here, which is a uh, a list and then you have fields which is another list and so on and so forth and this is of course cumbersome and you don't want to do that so i will show you another way which gives you more control over the json output and which is still included in plain java e7 so we will of course delete everything again and now our juxres resource will output something else called json array and this comes with the JSONP API, the Java API for JSON processing, which in fact allows us to create JSON objects in a programmatically way. And JSON array is a type out of that, so it will be an array of JSON objects here in that um, method. And what do we do? We of course um, give, uh, get the books again from the EJB. And of course we will use streams and lambdas again to map that book to a JSON object then following some objects builder, object, object builders with a builder pattern like fashion. This will create an object builder and now with add something as a string we can add some properties like in a map for the JSON object, right? So we can have something like a name which comes from the book, get name, right? And an author, which comes from the author, and the price, of course. And again, the interesting thing, this links here, which is, as you, as you could, uh, could see in the presentation, another JSON nested object. We will call that links here. 
and now you can build the whole thing the JSON object builder into a JSON object and this of course is a nested JSON object which also is created from an object builder and it will contain the self relation in that JSON object directly right and unfortunately I deleted everything so this will be a URI created in the same way just as before with the base URI builder from the books resource path and then the other path from the books resource method called get book and built with the ID as an argument to substitute that path parameter just as before and now we have the URI again and JSONP does not support URIs directly so you have to um, pass it as a string with dot to string which creates a string out of your URI and you can build it to a JSON object again which will be included down here in your other JSON object representing the book so now we have a um, stream of JSON objects which represent our books right and we have to um, collect the whole stream into a JSON array so of course we will use fancy Java 8 method handles with JSON array builder colon colon add and JSON array builder colon colon add and now we have a JSON array builder and by calling dot build we can in fact create that JSON array and that's it now we have a JSON array with all our, all our information from the books so what do we do here we call the EJB again to give us all the books we created a stream of books we mapped the stream of books to a stream of JSON or, uh, objects using this data here and created the links nested object using the URI info juxares um, component and at the end we collected everything into an array builder and into a JSON array questions no questions okay then we will implement the second thing get book from the ID again right so we have the book and now of course we will copy paste again to do the same thing here Oops. to include the same thing for a JSON object for the single book and this will return the JSON object directly and here as you saw in the um, presentation we can of course create a second link like this add to cart relation which can be then only included if your business logic matches right uh, you remember if your book is in, sto in stock for example so we create a second URI also from the URI info get base URI builder to the shopping cart resource which unfortunately doesn't exist yet so we'll create it this will be another JuxRS resource but I will not um, code the whole thing actually we just need this annotation here so that the JuxRS can access it and build the URI out of it so I will just close it again so this will be the second URI called um, add to cart URI which w can be also included in the um, JSON object. Add to cart, right? And add to cart URI dot to string. And of course, you could say if something, if your business logic matches, only then include this URI into your JSON object. And that's basically it. Questions? Yes. <laughs> Can someone please translate? Could 
could someone please uh, translate that to English? <laughs> And JSON object and and map. Ah, yeah, yeah. The, the map. Um, so the question was, what uh, what is the difference between the JSON object and the map? Um, the map itself is contained in your POJOs. So before the example before, I included everything in this class here, right? And we use Java types like long and string or map. So the map is, of course, comes from Java. So you could use this to, um, yeah, to add the links here. And the JSON mapping framework knows about map because it's a standard uh, Java type and knows that the maps, everything here, will be, of course, um, converted into a JSON object. So you probably could use JSON object directly here as well, but I don't think you want to mix and match your POJOs with the JSONP objects, like JSON object or JSON array, right? Because they have nothing, nothing in common. You probably don't do this here with JSON objects. It probably would work as well to use JSON objects here, but the other uh, other way would not work. If you have JSONP objects, then only um, strings and primitive types are supported. So you need the uh, JSONP objects like this here as nested objects directly. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Jason P. Yeah. Very good question. I will um, explain that in a minute. <laughs> so the question was, was this the uh, what actually the advantage is of using this approach, um, Jason P? Because of course you're right. At first it looks more complex as you do everything twice, like uh, naming your links here. Um, your property names here, but you get more um, you get more control and more power. And I will explain that in a minute. Very good question, and in a minute you will get your sticker. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Other questions so far? Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. I uh, right. Uh, yeah, I get this uh, question a lot, and uh, there's a lot of arguing in real world projects. So the question was, why am I you why, why am I injecting these objects here using package private and not the private name, right? And the simple answer is for testability, because now if you write a unit test for it, you could just simply replace your bookstore with a mocked object without needing uh, to do black magic like reflection to access this um, property here to change it in your tests. And the advantage is it doesn't matter if it's not private here because in for the production code your CDI implementation will prevent you from directly swapping it in production when you're in the, CD, uh, in the EJB container. So normally you just can say bookstore d uh, books resource dot bookstore set something, right? And that is the reason for it, actually. To test it, because in tests, you will, um, for simple unit tests, this is a completely other uh, topic, but for simple unit tests, you will not have the books resource in a, s uh, in a container, rather than you just create it using new, right? Because you only want to test the business logic. And then you can mock all these objects and simply inject it by setting the properties, because you have um, you have this access, the package private access, and that is the reason. Thank you very much for this uh, question. This, uh, Steven, he gets a sticker. <laughs> and you also uh, get a sticker in a second. Yes, you have to do your job now. No relaxing. And of course, in real world projects, you will outsource this logic into a separate component like a CDI managed bean, right? into a, a single class and with a single point of responsibility because you don't want to um, yeah. here and the gentleman over there and in a second he will get his answer as this question answered as well 
um, because you don't want to um, repeat yourself all over again. So if you don't have any other questions, I will run this example as well. And hopefully it also works. So we will stop the application server and rebuild the whole project. And of course it's still very fast because everything is still Java E7 only. And we will redeploy it on Wildfly again. And it's done. And we will now query the whole thing again. There is no difference here. We will still have the JSON array with the two books here. And of course, the second um, resource, the resource of the single books. And now you can see the second URI here, the add to cart relation, pointing to the shopping cart, which is only shown in the second resource. And this is the same thing using JSONP. And now about your question, why am I using JSONP here? Because as I showed here, if you want to have, now, now you get the impression how you build this uh, JSON objects programmatically, right? So you can basically do whatever you want as you state the name of your properties right here. And if you want to have more crazy complex JSON objects like this one with a lot of nested objects, then it's much simpler to create it in a single component, in a single method, this whole structure, rather than creating a huge hierarchy of Java objects with books and all the properties, then you have actions, which is a list of something, you ha then you have all these properties here, and fields, which is also a list or array of something, right? And you um, creating this in JSONP is much simpler. And of course, you get all the flexibility if you only want to include certain things like certain links, if some business logic matches, then this can be done very simple by wrapping it into a if and only including it in your JSONP call, in your builder call, if that logic matches. And this is basically the reason why I showed the JSONP example here as well, to give you more control over the JSON output. Thanks very much for your question. Did you get a sticker? Yeah, very good. Any other questions? Another small thing uh, which I wanted to show you where JuxRS can help you if you use this URI info to create URIs is if you use a different domain here. I um, used my local host file to point this local domain to local host as well then this will be in fact used to create your URIs, which is very helpful because this was the reason why I used this get base URI builder here. Because this base URI builder will create a URI based on the current client request, the HTTP request. And if the request was sent to a different domain with um, the server field, then this information will be taken into account while creating the URI and it will create the correct URI as the client sent it. So for enterprise scenarios, which is often the case where you proxy your application server with an Apache or an Nginx, and the uh, client of course sends the request to the proxy server, then the Java E API can still con um, construct the right URI using the originally sent domain, which is very helpful so you don't have to configure anything in your project, just use plain ju uh, JuxRS and it will work and will create the correct URI out of the box, which is very helpful, by the way. So do you have any other questions of what I did here in the live coding? Okay, so for more information, on this Siren hypermedia type, you could um, check out a GitHub project of mine. My GitHub account is S. Dushner. The project is called Juxores Hypermedia. And here I'm showing um, several approaches how this hypermedia APIs could be enabled using Juxores and Java E technology. And for example, 
I have I have a simple example here using only links. This is what I just programmed, and a more comprehensive example which uses Siren in a way which I could not show here due uh, to the time. But this will uh, in fact create a more complex Siren I API. You see example. You see here uh, the books um, as well. You can add books to the shopping cart, just what I showed in the presentation. You can modify some book selections and so on and so forth. And it has several approaches. And this is also, again, the answer to your question, why I'm using uh, JSONP. Because now this is the plain EE approach of the Siren hypermedia type. Now it uses JSONP to create this crazy complex JSON output. And as I said, you may outsource that into a single component. So this is a class called Entity Builder. This is just an example out of my project, which creates JSON objects here for a book, for example. And then you code this once, this build book method, which creates a JSON object out of your book with some information. And then you have this logic here only written once in your project and you can inject this CDI managed bean and create the JSON object in the same way all over again. And you see this has a lot of nested objects here and this is the reason why I would advise to use JSONP to create all that output otherwise you would have a really complex um, object hierarchy. And actually, I would prefer this over third-party dependencies. Like, um, there is a dependency, uh, this is another approach I showed here, um, called siren 4 j which also provides you some predefined builder patterns to create this um, content, content type output for you. But of course, you get, again, external dependencies with JSON mapping frameworks and so on and so forth, what you probably don't want to use. Because what you need here in the example I just showed is only one class you have to write once. And that's not a lot of effort. And then you can save a lot of third-party dependencies. And still your build, like I showed, are very fast. And of course your deployments as well. Have you any questions left? On hypermedia APIs in general, or on JAXRS and Java E in particular? Don't forget you get nice stickers from Stephen. If you ask questions, yeah, we have a lot of stickers left. <laughs> Everyone can ask a question. All right, so if you don't have any questions left, then thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>